secure a soft Brexit, so-called, to keep Scotland in the single market after Brexit, while continuing to pursue the SNP's ultimate goal of independence from the rest of the UK, which many in London now believe is all but impossible. I went to Edinburgh to meet her. First Minister, six months or so ago, sitting more or less right here, you were talking to Theresa May, and it seemed a very cordial first meeting after she became Prime Minister. I wonder, what's happened since then between the two of you? Uh, well, we've spoken on a few more occasions, met uh, once more, I think, and, and spoken on the phone. I have to say, though, to be perfectly frank, I don't feel as if I know any more about her negotiating objectives today than I did six months ago. And probably what's more worrying than that, I'm not sure she knows more about her negotiating objectives than she did back then as well. And I think that is increasingly of concern the closer we get to the triggering of Article 50. Do you seriously think there is no plan? Uh, yes, I, I do. And I, I say that uh, with a lot of regret because that puts every part of the UK, I think, into a very perilous position. You know, we saw last week with the resignation of Sir Ivan Rogers that you know, he didn't know what the plan was and he was supposedly the man who would lead the negotiations to try to achieve that plan. Now, my worry is that Theresa May, instead of behaving like a Prime Minister should, is putting the leadership of her own deeply divided party ahead of her responsibilities as Prime Minister and trying to appease the increasingly right-wing Brexiteers in her own party and instead of uh, prioritising what would be a sensible solution for the UK to stay in the single market, for example. And I think the interests of the country over these next few months really have to come to the fore. Now, at that meeting, she seemed to agree that Scotland as Wales and Northern Ireland would be part of the process of debating what, how we were going to leave the EU. Do you feel that simply hasn't happened? Uh, yes, I, I would have to say that. You know, there have been discussions. I mean, I took part with the First Ministers of Wales and, and Northern Ireland, the Deputy First Minister of Northern Ireland, in Downing Street, I think in October, uh, a meeting of the Joint Ministerial Committee. And I'm not exaggerating too much. I'm paraphrasing slightly, I admit, but I'm not exaggerating too much when I say that the Prime Minister sat on the other side of the table in that meeting and said Brexit means Brexit and not an awful lot more than that. And I came out of that meeting probably more frustrated after a, a meeting of that nature than I've ever been before. Now, the reason for that is that I'm, I'm the First Minister of Scotland and, you know, put aside, although we shouldn't put it aside, uh, the fact that Scotland voted to remain in the European Union. If the UK is coming out of the European Union, that has enormous implications for Scotland, as it does for other parts of the UK. It has enormous implications for our economy, for jobs, for living standards, for trade and investment, for the kind of society we are. And I want to play my part in making sure we get the right outcome from that. That's why the Scottish Government has published proposals that we hope are taken seriously. But thus far, almost two-thirds of the way to the triggering of Article 50, we know no more about the UK Government's position than we did the day after the referendum, and that is increasingly unacceptable. In those proposals, you've made it very clear that what you mean by a soft Brexit mm. or an acceptable Brexit involves staying inside the single market and staying mm. inside the customs union. The problem is that people were told all the way through the referendum that leaving the EU meant leaving those things. But I'm not and sure that's... that's I, I don't think that's the case. It is the there case, were, if I may well, say so. I, I, inter I interviewed David Cameron, George Osborne, well, Michael Gove, Boris Johnson, I asked well, I all remember, of them, and they all said, yes, it means leaving the single market. I, I remember hearing, I, I think, I, I could be proved wrong, but I think Boris Johnson saying, you know, the only good thing about the European Union was what he called the common yes. market, the single market, and leaving the EU didn't mean leaving the single market. But what I'm trying to do, and I've deliberately tried to take a step back from my preferred position, which is the UK as a whole stays in the EU, and say, look, we've got this situation where the UK as a whole voted to leave the EU. Different parts of the UK voted in different ways. Scotland voted to remain. Even in Scotland, a million people voted to leave. And although the UK as a whole voted to leave, almost half voted to remain. So can we find some common ground? Can we find some consensus ground and that's why I think staying in the single market it could be that consensus ground but more importantly it would avoid some of the deep damage to our economy and our society that a hard Brexit is going to do. The problem with staying in the single market is that means no control over migration from the EU and it means carrying on paying into the single market and that would be seen by a lot of those 52% as a betrayal. Well, let, let's break down these issues because the paper I published on behalf of the Scottish Government just before mm. Christmas actually goes into all of it these does, issues. Yes. Now, Theresa May has said 
that a number of things are redlined. So not being subject to the jurisdiction of the ECJ. Well, if you're like Norway is in the single market but not in the EU, then you're not subject to the direct jurisdiction of the ECJ. It's the EFTA court uh, that applies. Though in effect you well, are. I'm, I'm trying to, to see where she could, and this is a bit compromised, this where is not my preferred compromise. solution, so I, I recognise that it may not be her preferred solution, but can we find compromised ground? I think we need to get away from a situation, and I make no apology for saying this, where this obsession with uh, immigration, almost becoming an obsession with foreigners in this country, is trumping, if that's not the wrong word to use in these times, uh, the, the best interests of the economy. So I think we need a much more honest debate about Look, the benefits of migration to our economy. I just put it to you, given the politics in London, it is very, very unlikely that Theresa May will say we're going to stay in the single market or the customs union. <coughs> that compromise is probably unlikely. And you yourself have said that Indy Ref 2 is more well, likely than that. What, what I'm doing is trying to explore common ground, OK? And I've said I think the UK should stay in the single market and I want to work with others across the UK, across the political spectrum to see if we can achieve that as the objective of the UK. If that can't happen, then recognising that Scotland voted to stay in the EU by majority, by a significant majority, can we find a way of allowing Scotland to continue to stay in the single but market? But that surely is practically impossible. Well, we, again, the paper we published sets out the practical right. barriers but also sets out the basis on which those practical barriers can be overcome. So the paper you've published says, for instance, that for that to happen, for Scotland to stay inside the single market while the rest of the UK is not, would require the repatriation of, of important powers to the Scottish Parliament, Absolutely. including over immigration. But how is it possible for well, one part had, of the UK to have one immigration policy and England to have another we, immigration policy? We had policy? A, a group of MPs just the other day saying that we, we should move away from a one-size-fits-all immigration policy across the UK. You've got the Mayor of London arguing that London should have greater flexibility over immigration. You've got countries like okay. Canada and Australia that already operate a uh, differential system. Scotland used to have a situation but, but where if, we had a differential situation around post-study uh, work arrangements. What I'm saying, and this is an important point, Andrew, everything about Brexit is going to be complicated and difficult. I'm not denying yeah. the solution I'm putting forward would be complicated and difficult, but there are ways to overcome these difficulties because right, the well, alternative just, for Scotland... Let me Scotland, just ask you about one way, because sure. if the people of England have just voted to, quote, take control of immigration from the EU, and Scotland has an open border to the rest of the EU in terms of migration, how can you possibly not have a border between England and Scotland with people, otherwise people would just move down into England? The, the people go into this in, in, in which, some in which case? detail, because, well, first thing, I'll, I'll come on to that in the detail of it in a second, but... Let's not forget, we've got a UK government right now that is at pains to say to the Republic of Ireland, an independent country that is going to continue to be in the EU, that it doesn't have to choose between trading with the EU and trading with the UK, that there doesn't have to be a hard border uh, because of Brexit. So if that's true for Ireland, there is no reason why that wouldn't also be true for Scotland. But if you take the, the issue of free movement, for example, uh, you know, People would continue to get their passports checked as they come into the UK at the external UK border, as is the case just now. If people come into Scotland uh, and if the concern, as I appreciate, would be would they go to England or other parts of the UK and seek to work there. Yes. Theresa May is already talking about the uh, arrangements that she's going to put in place in terms of employment checks and such like. There are practical ways of overcoming these things, but mm. if we're going to get into the practical discussion about how these things can be overcome, we first have to have a UK government that's going to meet uh, the Scottish government halfway to try to discuss that. I'm co compromising. I'm prepared to compromise. I need to have a UK mm. government that's prepared to do likewise. This is a compromise which gives you, in effect, independence. Well, or something th very, very close to the, it. the proposal we've put forward wouldn't make Scotland independent. Yes, but it would very have, nearly. Yes, it would have significant additional powers for Scotland. I have to say, around some of these additional powers, notwithstanding whether there would be a different single market solution for Scotland, there's already growing cross-party support that in the post-Brexit landscape, there needs to be a fundamental look at the devolution settlements. So I think some of those arguments apply regardless of the position around uh, the single okay. market. But on the, there is a fundamental question that arises here for Scotland. I'm trying to compromise. You know, I lead a party that, you know, many of whom would want an independence referendum tomorrow. I am trying to act as First Minister to say is there compromise ground. But if we are in a position where I'm doing that, but we have a Prime Minister, a UK government that say no compromise, Scotland just has to, you know, lump shut it. up and like it or lump it, then the question for Scotland, and it's a much more fundamental question than the EU or Brexit, 
is are we happy with that? Are we happy to have no voice in the UK, to simply have to accept the direction of travel that an increasingly right-wing uh, UK government wants to impose upon us? What do you say to those people uh, across the UK who voted to leave the EU, who listen to you now and say, she's just a wrecker, she is trying to overturn the democratic vote of the entire UK? Well, I, I'm not trying to do that, but I would ask people to equally understand that I'm the First Minister of Scotland. Scotland is a, a country, we're part of the UK uh, right now, but we voted to, to remain. And I've got a duty, particularly given that this is not some academic debate, this is a debate that has real implications for jobs and living standards of people the length and breadth of the country. I've got an obligation to seek to protect Scotland's interests, and that's what I'm trying to do. So I'm compromising. Uh, but at the end of the day, I'm not going to sit back while Scotland is driven off a hard Brexit cliff edge with all the implications for jobs that, uh, and the type of country we are that that would have. Well, let's come to that. You have said that if you get what's mm -hmm. been called a soft Brexit, staying inside the single market, then a second independence referendum mm -hmm. is off the agenda for a while. Mm -hmm. How long is a while? But How long? Let me... Let me they explain exactly what I'm saying. The, the argument for independence doesn't go away in those circumstances. The argument for independence is much bigger than the European Union. Uh, what I've said, though, is if we can, and I said this in this very room the day after the referendum, that I would seek to find ways within the UK, recognising the diversity of opinion on independence within Scotland, uh, to seek to protect Scotland's interests within the UK. If we can do that, the, the independence argument doesn't go away, but we don't need to have that decision within the time scale of Brexit. But that involves... What is the, sorry, what is the time scale? Well, Are we talking about this Parliament? I, so I, no independence referendum during the course of this Parliament? You're asking me what the time scale of Brexit is. I can't answer well, that question. Um, but it could entirely. be 20, it could but, be 20 but let me tell you what my assumption is. My assumption is that in, uh, from the point at which Article 50 is triggered, we have a two-year period uh, after which the, the UK is no longer in the EU. Now, that may change because I don't know what the negotiations are going so to deliver. a soft Brexit means no independence referendum in, in the time, over the next two and a half years. I said in the timescale of, of Brexit. But I have mm. tried from the 24th of June onwards to take a logical uh, path through this. And to, and you know, at the moment we're the only government in the whole of the UK that's put forward mm. a plan, a possible way forward. Now, if that's going to uh, get any legs behind it, it needs to have a UK government that's willing to talk to us. Because if what I okay, well, encounter with the Prime Minister think... the next time we sit in this room is I'm not interested, then Scotland mm. is in that position of, you know, we were told we were an equal partner in the UK, but the reality is very, very different. Well, here's where we come down to the hard politics, because it seems to me that the view in London is that Nicola Sturgeon is trying to call our bluff. And we can call her bluff. She yeah. cannot win an independence referendum in Scotland because of the economics, because well, of the I'd border issue, because of the euro. It's all this is not, just bluff. Well, they will be making a big mistake if they think that I'm in any way bluffing. Because if it comes to the point, you know, two years after Scotland being told, the quote in the independence referendum was, Scotland, don't leave the UK, lead the UK. Here we are, we voted to stay in the EU. We were told that voting no was the only way we could stay in the EU. And we now face being taken out of the EU. Now, that creates a, a much more fundamental question for Scotland. If on something as fundamentally important as uh, the membership of the EU and the single market and all the implications that has for us, if we're going to be ignored, if our voice is going to be completely cast aside, our interests cast aside, then that can happen on anything. And we have to ask ourselves in Scotland, are we happy to have the direction of our country, the kind of country we want to be determined by a right-wing Conservative government, perhaps for the next 20 years, or do we want to take control of our own future? And that's a case that in those circumstances, I, I think it would be right for Scotland to uh, have the opportunity to decide. But we're not looking at Indy Ref 2, as it's called, in 10 years' time or five years' time. We're looking at much quicker than that. In the context, if, if we're facing if, if a, hard a hard Brexit, Brexit I, I yes. would think, yes, uh -huh, if, if we're talking about a hard Brexit. But let me not get away from this point. I'm putting to Theresa May uh, a compromise solution. Um, Theresa May is watching <laughs> one message to her very clearly. What do you say? Uh, don't disregard Scotland, because it's not acceptable to do so. Uh, you said during the independence referendum that Scotland was an equal partner in the UK. It's now time to prove that and how you respond to the sensible compromise consensus proposals that the Scottish Government has put forward will tell as much, possibly everything we need to know about whether Scotland really is an equal partner or whether that's just rhetoric. Nicola Sturgeon, thank you very much. And that is all.